Okay. I, I never talk to patients and families standing up. Um, I always sit down every time I walk into a room. Um, so I figured if we're asking questions, I'm gonna do what I usually do and sit. Um, so anyone have any questions they would like to know, like to ask? Sure. So you didn't talk about it. I think you might've talked about it maybe in another session, but a lot of our kids have issues with blotchy hotspot skin. Yes. Um, that in my daughter, it's, I don't think of it as being related to just dy dystonia is not happening kind of at the same time, but can you talk a little bit about these, what you know about this kind of where sure. one part of your body is warmer than the other and. Right. So, um, when, so the, the little boy in the third video, um, you saw his, his sort of really, really red cheeks um, when the rest of him was, was his normal skin tone. So that's called, you know, we call that flushing, right? So flushing is um, basically the same as blushing, right? Um, only, you know, blushing, you usually think of, you know, I've done something embarrassing and I sort of show my cards because my cheeks turn red. You know, when it comes to flushing, it's the same phenomenon, right? Your blood vessels in your skin dilate. Um, so therefore they get red, your skin gets red um, and it gets warm to the touch, okay? It can go the other way, okay? You can have it where the skin looks sort of lacy and almost purplish in color. Um, and what's happening there is the nerves and blood vessels under the skin are contracting, and that's why they look sort of blue and purplish, and if you feel it, cool to the touch. And it's all part of that autonomic nervous system regulating blood vessel tone in your skin and in the nerves underneath your skin. Yep. So it's a big part of what we see in folks with autonomic dysfunction, regardless of cause, regardless of, of condition. Um, so in its most extreme form, um, you can have that sort of flushing to the point where the whole hand or arm or leg or foot will be completely red and swollen uh, and painful to the touch. Um, and that's also a problem where the nerves in your skin are basically firing too much and causing a flushing to the point of swelling and pain. Um, yeah, it's all real. It's all part of, yeah. And it's, it's um, can be quite miserable. Um, and that's why, you know, what I tell patients and families, um, my nurses um, tell patients and families every time somebody uh, is coming to see me, um, the glorious thing about cell phones is we can now give it, get everything on video. So I tell patients and families, get it all on video send it to me, bring it with you, because it may not happen when I'm in the office with you. But if I can see it, I can tell you what it is. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, when you, when you talked about dopamine, it made me think, what about the class of drugs, the antipsychotics or neuroleptics? Do they make things better or worse for the autonomic stuff? So, you know, the, the neuroleptics, um, so I, I didn't talk about the neuroleptics um, because of the fact that they, um, pharmacologically speaking, right? Um, they're, they're what we call dirty drugs, right? So they act on, unlike something like trileptal, Okay, or oxcarbazepine, okay, something like carbamazepine, where the way it works is it works on a single channel, right? So both trileptal and oxcarbazepine, or in carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine act by changing sodium channels, okay? The way the neuroleptics work, whether it be the old neuroleptics um, like Haldol and, and Pimazide, and the newer ones, Risperidone, Abilify, is they act on multiple different 
receptors, multiple different neurotransmitters. So when you have, when you use those agents, especially in, in complex patients, you're going to get side effects and other organ systems that you don't anticipate. Um, and then the long-term side effects of those agents, um, weight gain, changes in cholesterol levels, risk of developing type two diabetes. Um, you know, it's a hard pill to swallow as a, as a pediatric doctor to say, you know, I'm gonna use those in, a, in an already medically complex kid. Um, and that's why whenever I'm considering, um, you know, do I need to use something of that nature? Um, that's, you know, when I think about, and I, I do, I, in my patient population that I see, the thing that helps me to figure out what I'm going to use is getting neurotransmitter levels um, on my patients um, to help guide me, because I don't know, so if they're dopamine, say they could have dystonia and all these symptoms, but they could actually be dopamine deficient, Okay. Um, in which case I'm going to use medications that increase dopamine levels, things like amantadine, things like um, uh, carbidopa, levodopa. Um, if you have somebody who's dopamine deficient and you give them a dopamine blocker, they're going to get a whole lot worse, right? So rather than, than sort of take the trial and error approach, if there's a chemistry approach that I can use, if I can say, okay, here I know what's going on now, because I have this test that tells me what the chemistry is of your child's brain, um, that's going to guide my treatment. So most of the time, whenever I'm not sure, or the child's simply too medically fragile to undergo a, a semi-elective procedure, um, I'll use meds that don't touch dopamine at all to treat dystonia. I'll use medications that maybe work on acetylcholine or a medication like baclofen, which works on GABA, so that I avoid the potential for either too much or too little dopamine by, by picking a different neurotransmitter that can also treat dystonia. Um, and, and you know, if you would ask the younger me, you know, 20 some years ago when I first started, I would have been a lot more, yeah, let's try it. Um, but 20 some years of clinical practice and seeing patients come to me with side effects and sometimes permanent side effects of those medications, I've become a lot more cautious than 20 years ago me, uh, which actually had the same haircut then. Um, <laughs> no, I was, I was so uh, follicularly challenged in high school. My senior gag gift was a box of miracle Grow. Um, <laughs> uh, true story. Um, so that's, that's why I shy away from those, um, just decades of experience. We have some questions online. Um, the first question is, can the impact from PSH result in hypoactivity, such as low respiration, no sweating, low temperature, slow GI motility, erratic sleep patterns? So no. Um, so that is, in fact, the opposite problem. Um, and I didn't go into the opposite problem um, but the opposite problem does exist where you have autonomic insufficiency um, or, or autonomic failure. Um, and the symptoms of autonomic insufficiency um, are low body temperature, sedation, slowed gut motility, slowed heart rate, decreased sweating, um, and th that is a real entity. Um, it's much more rare. Um, when I think about the number of patients that I have across the, the movement disorder neurogenetic realm who, who have that phenomenon versus PSH, um, I can probably count I, on less than two hands the number of patients that I treat who have autonomic insufficiency or autonomic failure, um, but it is also like PSH, very under-recognized. Um, now in those patients, um, you don't really need the CSF neurotransmitters because you know, based on the fact that they're cold, sleepy, no gut motility, 
and slow heart rate, you know they have dopamine deficiency, there's no question. Um, so you use medications to increase autonomic output. Um, and what I use um, are the ADHD medications. I use the stimulant medications, right? Because they stimulate the central nervous system. And the nice thing about stimulants is they come in um, medically complex patient uh, friendly forms. There are skin patches, there are liquids, there are extended release liquids. Um, because most of my, all of my patients who have that problem aren't taking pills by mouth. Um, so yeah, there's all kinds of ways to treat that problem, uh, which is the exact opposite of what I talked about. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> we'll talk. Okay, we have some more questions online. <clears throat> okay, my son had daily episodes as an infant that looked like what you're describing, screaming, red, flushed, sweating through, through his clothes, which would last for hours. These episodes started slowly started getting better around four months of age and then completely resolved by seven months of age. Do you have any clues as to why he outgrew them? Of note, he still, he still does show signs of dermatological symptoms such as random polar uh, Raynaud's syndrome, oh, you, you can read it, so. yeah. um, but no other signs. Have you noticed that they've noticed? Any that is clues? absolutely fascinating. I have never had a patient who had that and outgrew it. Um, that's amazingly awesome. Um, I would love to know more details <laughs> because it's, I, I've never, never seen that happen and would love to know more. Um, so maybe get my email from Keith and, and we'll communicate because um, that opens a whole new way of, of thinking about things that I'd never conceived of before. Okay, thank you. And it's, it, it's weird that there are so many Keiths involved in this discussion today, yes. right? And it's so confusing. Well, but even more so, uh, Keith and I, it turns out we have the exact same birthday, April 12th. <laughs> well, there you go. Okay, another question. Could deep brain stimulation help our kids with neurostromes? So um, DBS um, is, is one of the tools that I use the most in, in, my, in my clinical practice. Um, DBS is FDA approved for the treatment of dystonia in children seven years of age and older in the United States, okay? Um, when you use DBS to treat dystonia, um, regardless of cause, um, if you improve the dystonia, um, you do see improvements in other symptoms and other systems, okay? So the basal ganglia are, you know, the simplified diagram that I showed is, is the way to think about it in its most basic form. But the basal ganglia have multiple channels of processing that, that run parallel to each other. So in addition to the motor channel that we, that we talked about, there's a sensory channel, there's a cognitive channel, and there's an emotional channel um, that run through the basal ganglia. So most, almost everyone who has dystonia has some other thing along with it, obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety, things of that nature. We know that if we treat the dystonia using DBS, things that that patient also has calmed down, okay? Um, I'm not aware of anybody who um, has done DBS or even conceived of DBS for, for PSH or anything like PSH um, because no one has, has really no one's ever asked the question before of could it work? The biggest thing you'd have to know, which we don't know is within the brain, um, where does it come from, right? Does it really come from the hypothalamus like we think it does? 
um, or does it come from somewhere else and the hypothalamus just gets uh, blamed because it's where all the, the nerve cells live? Um, yep. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? We have more questions online, but, but let's take some from the live audience. Hi. Hi. Um, my son has had um, what we've been calling episodes for six or seven years, probably six to 10 times a day, each time lasting for at least half an hour of um, the skin color changes, the excessive sweating, the um, odd posturing, particularly centered around from his hips down. Um, this has led to extreme self-harm um, or he's had to be in a helmet, full face cage, that sort of thing. Um, we tried lots of meds. I, I watched your um, presentation online last year and balled my way through it because I felt like it was the first time anyone was recognizing what was happening to him. Um, oh, I'm getting emotional talking about it. Um, I'm, I'm wondering um, if what's happened now is it's progressed into constant dystonia. Mm. So he's extremely arched. It, it's very much centered around his trunk rather than just the, the episodes of yep. it. Is that something you've seen before? So um, one of the things about dystonia, um, so, so the question then becomes, um, is the primary problem the storming or is the primary problem the dystonia? Mm. Okay, so what we know about dystonia is that dystonia evolves over time. So dystonia often starts in, in humans as intermittent and, and temporary and then can progress so that it is all the time every day, okay? So in hearing the story, it sounds like, you know, the big problem is a dystonia problem. Um, and I would talk to the folks who treat him about treating the dystonia um, because that, that's, you know, when dystonia progresses, it goes from intermittent to constant. And, you know, for those of you who, who's ever had a Charlie horse? Mm -hmm. Okay, hurts like heck, right? Okay, a Charlie horse is what dystonia feels like. Okay, it is dystonia. Okay, so almost all of us have experienced temporary dystonia because um, that's what a Charlie horse is. Okay, you know, when you see you have a Charlie horse, your muscle sort of pops up off your leg or your toes curl, that's dystonia, okay? So yeah, if he's having that much dystonia, the folks that treat him have to treat as dystonia. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Okay, um, more questions online. Symptoms seem to, to be similar as you showed with Gree, but speech issues was not showing. Could speech also be affected by autonom autonomic issues? So speech, not as much affected by autonomic issues, um, but dystonia, absolutely. So when, when you think about um, dystonia, if it affects your, your face, your mouth, your throat, you're talking like this because you can't get anything to move. Okay, so that's what dystonia can do to affect speech. Um, so part of the way to understand movement disorders um, is you have to be able to say, okay, if I take my body and make these parts of my body not able to move, what do I look like? What do I feel like? What do I sound like? Um, so yeah, that's how dystonia can sound of your speech. It can steal all of your speech. One of the big clues whenever I hear, whenever I'm meeting a new patient with dystonia um, is how many consonant sounds they make versus how many vowel sounds they make. If you have dystonia involving your, your throat, your lips, your tongue, almost all of your vocalizations are gonna be vowel sounds because you can't get your lips, tongue, or throat to make those sounds. Um, so you often, when you treat dystonia and it's awesome because you, you see this kid and, and he or she is not making any sounds at all. 
and or any consonant sounds at all and you treat them and they come back and they're starting to to use their lips tongue and mouth and it's like okay yep that's what it was wow. i never heard that question about the vowel vowel versus consonant so it's an interesting thing to i i couldn't answer that now but now i'm gonna have to pay attention is there a typical age for onset of psh and can it manifest manifest later in childhood oh it can show up at any point any time um, and, and, you know, one of the things that's the most humbling about taking care of patients with, with neurogenetic conditions is um, you have to, as a physician, constantly be open-minded to the fact of what could this be that it wasn't there before and it's there now. Um, there's no, there's no timetable for any of this. Um, cause as I talked about, you know, for, for all of the great science that's been done, the science related to the stuff we're talking about hasn't been done. The basic science of, of what causes all of these symptoms in, in your children hasn't been done yet. Hasn't even made the radar of the folks doing the channel work, um, which is why I put it out there for them to, to start. Great. Thank you. Are there any in person? Go ahead. Hi. Um, so this is sort of anecdotal. I hope it's on topic. Yeah. Uh, my son, Nathan, has a GRIN 2A um, disorder. He has seizures daily. Um, uh, usually after a seizure, he will either be knocked out or calm or uh, and, and falling asleep is a big trigger. This past Christmas, uh, this most recent Christmas day, uh, 7 p.m., he had a seizure. Uh, and then afterwards, instead of his normal sort of recovery, he, he got into this sort of very panicked, terrified, sort of gasping and afraid and looking side to side. Yep. And it lasted about a half an hour. And it was the first time that had ever happened. It's happened since then. Um, when that happened, we got, we were very worried. We ended up giving him his uh, rescue med, which is a Valium mm -hmm. um, that we're supposed to give him if he had seizures longer than five minutes, which we hadn't given him in, in two years. Um, and we took him to the hospital. They said he was fine, uh, sent us home. Afterwards, he didn't have any seizures for four days after that incident, which was extraordinary for him. He normally has multiple seizures every single day. Okay. It's very, it was just very weird. I wanted to ask if that, if you have any input or, or ideas about what happened there. He has since had these sort of panics as well, um, but we haven't had a repeat of that same experience. And to, to clarify, the, the, further episodes of sort of panic symptoms has that also been after other seizures or has it been separated um i think usually after other seizures yeah. yeah so you know when we think about the basic neurology of seizure um the basic neurology of seizure is high voltage synchronized electrical activity that disrupts normal brain activity okay after a seizure you think about as you describe sort of most folks get sort of calm, relaxed, because the brain is stunned, okay? It is not unheard of to have things the opposite way, where sort of after a seizure, agitated, scared, um, um, sort of all the autonomic stuff. I, I have one young man um, who, um, he is now, He's now 22, 23. I met him when he was um, a high school sophomore, junior. Um, he came to me after having seen somebody else in our group um, for episodes where he um, became acutely panicked and felt that he needed to run, okay? And um, he had, Somebody had thought he had panic attacks. Somebody else thought he may have Tourette, and this was a complex motor tick. Um, and it turned out he was actually having seizures, um, and the panic sensation was coming because of his seizures. Um, proved that with EEG, put him on seizure meds, no more panic running episodes. Uh, so yeah, it's not unheard of an epilepsy to have sort of post-seizure panic autonomic output surges, um, yeah. Do you, do you have any 
ideas about this four days without this this period that was abnormal after this the first time this happened with no seizures whatsoever and should we be regularly giving him valium i mean i don't want to do that but i you know what do you think that that was the cause of that or any ideas at all so you know for after having that and sort of four days after no seizures um you know i as a non-epileptologist yeah. um I don't know. Yeah. Um, that the, the nice thing about getting old is you feel more comfortable saying, I don't know. Of course. Um, 20 years ago, I would have tried to make up an explanation, um, but I truly have no idea. Uh, well, thank you very much. Yeah. Ted, was that the only the only instance that you gave volume or were there yes, more? We have not given him the volume since then. We actually have used clonazepam a few times. That's sort of, that's sort of our lesser rescue med that we give him when he sometimes have, has ticking, you know, a leg will just start going. And not stop, but he seemed otherwise fine. We were prescribed clonazepam for those instances that we sort of grind up and sort of just put a foot in his mouth. So we've yeah. used that a few so times. That, okay. Um, but we have not used the value. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, we have a lot of questions online that actually come in. Um, can the neurotransmitter le levels fluctuate throughout the day where you possibly wouldn't get an accurate reading of the overall picture of neurotransmitter? levels if so how would you account for that okay so uh, the, the my my colleague keith highland as i told you way too many keiths involved in this conversation so dr highland has a very precise way that csf neurotransmitter levels csf needs to be obtained to get neurotransmitter levels um they actually have to go in specialized tubes because the molecules are so quickly degraded. Um, they also have to be kept extremely cold. Um, so there is a whole protocol to collect CSF neurotransmitters that if um, the institutions like mine um, or Children's Hospital who you know, has you know, a bunch of neurologists who who think about these groups of conditions. Um, you know, we we do this procedure so regularly that um, our radiologists who do the procedure, our lab, everybody, it's all coordinated and orchestrated so that we get accurate results. Um, so if that's something that your child's neurologist um, thinks may be worthwhile. Um, they, they need to make sure they collect the sample right, prepare the sample right, and ship the sample right, or you won't get accurate results. It is a very precise uh, test to be done. Yeah. Oh, and for those of you who um, are interested in that, I was talking to one of the basic scientists from a, a biotech company who came to ask me questions. And you can get CSF neurotransmitter levels on mice. So my ask for them to start doing neurotransmitters on the mice looks like it may be a go. So. Great. Um, this is probably a question on a lot of our, our minds is who can diagnose kids with PSH, a neurologist, a PCP, sleep doctor? How do we educate healthcare professionals about this? And after being told so many times, that this is all behavioral or reflux. Okay. Um, so um, we'll, we'll take the first question, who can diagnose it? Um, anybody who's willing to sit down and listen. Um, and, and that's the big struggle. Um, so I, I know neurologists who will say, that's not a thing. I don't believe that's a thing. Um, I literally have a patient that I doesn't have a patient doesn't have a Greek condition has another neurogenetic condition, but they were told by their neurologist, PSH isn't a thing because I don't believe in it. That's not what your kid has. Um, okay. Um, so it, it's, that's why I do talks like this. This is why I go to when folks ask me to talk about this topic. Um, because um, I'm trying to educate the medical and scientific community on the fact that A, it's real, B, 
especially in, in this group of conditions, there's a whole lot of anatomy and chemistry as to why. Uh, so any neurologist who will listen. Um, the other group of, of specialists um, who, who know this condition very, very, very well and will often make a diagnosis um, if, a neuro if a neurologist isn't involved or um, if you don't have a, a neurologist is a physiatrist, so phy physical medicine and rehabilitation doctors. So PM&R doctors, both adult and pediatric, see this phenomenon frequently um, because they see it in kids after brain injury. It's also, there's a, there's a similar phenomenon uh, called autonomic dysreflexia, which occurs after spinal cord lesion. Um, it's the same thing as PSH basically, but it's at your, whatever level you've had your spinal cord injury and down. Um, and it has the same triggers in terms of bowel, bladder pain. So physiatrists, um, either adult or pediatric physiatrists are also experts and probably more expert than most neurologists because they see it a whole lot more. Um, but what I tell, you know, I, I've had, um, many of you come up and say, you know, I showed your talk that you gave before and took the videos of what my child was doing and they finally diagnosed me and finally treated. Um, yeah, you just need folks who are willing to sit down and listen. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Um, we have more questions online, but is there, is there any more live questions from the audience? This is just a quick question. I just wanted to clarify, um, it, what is the actual mechanism? So is it that the dystonia happens first and then the autonomic reaction happens in response to the pain? So it depends, okay? So, so, one of, so part, of the, part of what I do, part of what keeps me um, intellectually honest is, um, Every time I walk into a room, um, I let the patient and family tell me what's happening and I ask questions. I never go into a room saying, this patient's gonna have this, this patient's gonna have that, okay? Um, so my, my mentor, uh, who was a, a giant in the field of child neurology, a physician named Michael Painter, um, Mike was an expert diagnostic doctor. Um, he practiced before tests were a thing, right? And uh, Mike told all of us, neurology is about history. If you don't know what a patient has by the time you're done taking their history, you need more history, right? So, so a good neurologist is someone who is going to sit and listen until you tell your entire story and then say, I think I know what it is. Let me ask some more questions. Mm -hmm. Someone who walks in and says, oh, yep, yeah, this is what you got going on. No, nope. find somebody else. Come on up. This is all relatively new for me. Um, so I have more of a basic question for you. Um, but one of, the, one of the questions I always have, and then some of my friends have, um, just back to the basics, as far as um, talking about the sleep-wake cycles mm -hmm. that we have, a lot of these kiddos have issues with. Um, I know you were talking about, you know, being within the hypothalamus and the autonomic nervous system. I was wondering if you could explain what is happening again to these kiddos and why, um, sleep wake cycles are such an issue. Sure. So they're, they're multi, that's a great question and a very deep question. Um, so, um, if you look at the basic neurology of sleep, um, there are two systems that are, are at the most core simple for regulating sleep and wake. Okay. Your first system is your serotonin melatonin system. Right? That's the system that if working properly, you have no problem falling asleep in a short period of time, okay? presuming that you don't have anything else that's keeping you awake, causing pain. Okay? The symptoms of that system not working well 
are, I'm calm, I'm relaxed, I'm not having pain, I'm not having dystonia, everything else is cool, and just I'm just laying there awake for hours, okay? So when that system doesn't work, you get what's called primary insomnia, right? You just literally cannot fall asleep, okay? The second system that's involved in regulating sleep-wake is the norepinephrine system, okay? The typical phenomenology there is I fall asleep just fine, but then typically I wake up somewhere between 1 and 4 a.m., and I am up and I am ready to go, and I am up for hours, and it is party time. Mm -hmm. And no matter how much melatonin you give me, I'm not going back to sleep, okay? Mm -hmm. That is a problem of way too much norepinephrine because norepinephrine is what cre I talked earlier about arousal, right? I meant when I talked about arousal, I meant waking up and being alert. If you've got way too much norepinephrine kicking in in the middle of the night, it's midnight party time every night in your house. Okay, who has that problem? Yeah, yeah, that's the problem. Anytime. Um, so I'm here. So a question on um, is genome mind tests similar to testing neurotransmitter levels? Um, if I if I if I remember correctly, uh, genome mind Gino. testing is, um, and I could Google it real quick. Um, <laughs> I promise that's what I'm doing if I pull up my phone. I'm pretty <laughs> sure genome mind is another, is a lab that does what is called pharmacogenetic testing. Um, so in the world of neurology and neuropsychiatry, we use pharmacogenetic testing all the time. Um, what that looks at is we all have genes that regulate how fast our body breaks down medications once we take them. You get one copy of a gene from your mom, one copy of a gene from your dad. And genome mind testing, the, the lab we use at Children's Mercy to do that is called One Ohm. And what that tells you is how do your enzymes break down medications, and you can look at, in some of the labs, the genetics of your different dopamine and serotonin receptors, but you can't actually measure the level of neurotransmitters. Um, the other thing with neurotransmitters, there are labs that will claim that they can give you neurotransmitter results accurately from spit or from urine or from blood, um, there's a reason that I didn't talk about finding neurotransmitter levels that way, and we'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, well, Laura. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, yeah, just a, a question, and, and um, Keith, you and I talked yesterday, and I have so much gratitude because Bryson, literally before the clonidine for years, we thought he was having seizures, and now... Um, through working with our neurologist and with Keith, we realize that he's actually having PSH and um, the clonidine has changed our lives from him having like 10 to 20 a day of these episodes to some days he doesn't have any. Um, so it's kind of, a, it feels like a miracle for, <laughs> for us in our lives. And he's now starting to learn, which is a really interesting um, development as well. But one of my questions to you is he still does have some of these episodes and um, even prior what you know what would happen is there would be some kind of trigger um, and some days noise was the biggest trigger and mm. other days heat and um, and the episode would start and sometimes they would be five minutes and sometimes they would be half an hour and for him it was very violent like kicking rolling yep. biting trying to kick us and but then there was like a shut off. So all of a sudden, like he would go from that to like, it would just stop Yep. and he'd sit up and he'd kind of look at us and smile like this huge grin and mm -hmm. I'm like, hey buddy, like what, what's going on? And he kind of looks at me like, what are you looking at me like that for? Um, you know, I wasn't just kicking you and hitting you. Um, so I guess my question is, what is that instant like shut off? Yeah. And, why? And then is there anything that we could do? Because you mentioned like once it starts, you kind of have to let it play out. But is there 
anything we could do knowing there's that shut off like what's happening in that moment right so the shut off phenomenon of these um you know because some people have exactly that they'll go from doing this to be just fine like that and then other times it'll happen um where it sort of builds up slowly plateaus and then dies down slowly um and you know the when you have it where it's just on off um like a switch right the only explanation when you have something that happens that abruptly is abnormal brain cell firing on abnormal brain cell firing off right there's the only thing physiologically that would do that right only abnormal activity probably as i alluded well as i not indicated probably from the hypothalamus and then whenever that abnormal firing shuts off he's like hey cool i'm fine <laughs> right um so um i had i have a young man that i take care of who has a, a different condition um who um has dystonia um and has a, a dbs and he has been had been seeing ha, and is seeing our chief of psychiatry um for for many years and his his moms had asked me like hey, do you think that there's anything neurologic to what's going on here um i said well tell me what happens like there will be times like two to three days where he becomes Mr. Hyde and he is angry and aggressive and hitting and kicking and we don't feel safe. And then a couple of days later, it goes away and it's like nothing ever happened. And he can't tell us why he did that. Um, and I'm like, huh. So I did what I do, I'm like, let's try some clonidine. And this is a young man who walks, he has severe sensory neural hearing impairment. So a lot of his communication is by signing. And sure enough, um, gone, right? So it, it can happen you know, to, to patients with all kinds of central nervous system dysfunction. And it's, it's really, really, um that sudden sometimes um it's it's what keeps me off the streets um, yeah. thank you i use all of these one-liners with patients um it's yeah. neurology should be funny right you should enjoy you should you should enjoy seeing your neurologist right um we have lots more. Um, this, <laughs> now I, I know why six. they made uh, this for an hour. Uh, <laughs> so our, our son has severe autonomic respiratory dysfunction while he's awake only. Oh, here I go. Yeah. It's a long one. Yeah. Um, so to us, so that everybody knows, to us here uh, seems, he seems to be getting worse, longer periods of um, catatonic, mm. more frequent clusters. His O2 levels are very unstable. Um, chronically low. You, do you see similar deteriorations in other kids' respiratory dysonia? Any recommendations? He's currently trialing for a CPAP map and two. So anytime I see low CO2, um, that tells me hyperventilation, right? So um, something is causing uh, pretty significant hyperventilation of CO2 is chronically low. Uh, now, the other possibility is that it could be a medication side effect. Can we put that uh, question, uh, question, question back, up. back up? There are a number of medications that we use in the neurology world that their chemistry is such that they change acid-base balance in the body. Um, they make your blood more acidic. Um, so the other thing to think about if with this respiratory dysfunction while awake only um, is, is, is the child on 
a medication that's causing what's called metabolic acidosis. So that's why the CO2 is low. And what's happening while awake is a symptom of a medication side effect. So um, yeah, that's, it's one of two things there, um, either hyperventilation or a medication that's causing the CO2. Finding the cause of the CO2 problem is going to help what's going on there. Great, thank you. Um, next question online. Um, my child's neurologist wants to put him on gabapentin to help with frequent nighttime awakenings. Is there um, is that a medication that you would recommend, or is there something better you would recommend for poor sleep? So, um, gab, I, I absolutely um, love gabapentin as a medication. Um, it is on my, you know, in, in my top you know, super safe long-term medications. Um, we use it frequently for a sleep disorder, sleep disruption. Um, without knowing more, I would say that, you know, if you've got a neurologist who says gabapentin is the right answer, he or she's probably right. There are things besides um, nighttime wakening because of too much norepinephrine that gabapentin works really well for, um, like restless leg syndrome. Um, so yeah, it, it's one of my top safe medications that I use very frequently across my patient population, regardless of diagnosis. Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, thank you, Dr. Kaufman. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question about uh, puberty. So uh, what changes <laughs> my puberty bring to all this? <sighs> um, so puberty is um, what I tell my patients when it comes and what I tell my parents and families when it comes to puberty onset um, is it's going to be a wild ride. Okay. Whether you're um, male or female, it's going to be a wild ride. Okay. And the reason is um, puberty is a biological process, right? In that biological process, you have hormonal surges, okay? Regardless of whether you're male or female, you have hormonal surges, okay? Um, when you're male and have hormonal surges, you typically think of irritable, cranky, grumpy, aggressive. You think low dose roid rage, right? Um, when you're female, you can have the whole spectrum, right? In terms of irritable, cranky, tearful, um, because, and, and these surges are unpredictable, right? So whenever I have my patients, what I do counseling wise for my patients, um, as soon as we start to get into the, the nine, 10, 11 range, is I, I start asking all the questions of any underarm hair, any pubic hair, any breast development. And then I counsel about the fact that both men, young men and young women have hormonal surges. If you see symptoms that come and go and you can't explain why, um, then start keeping a calendar and try to look to see, is it every so many weeks? Is it every so many days? And if you start to see patterns, then you know, okay, this is hormones. And that's why it's there some days and there it's not. And that's why it's cyclical because we all cycle even before we start to see the physical manifestations of puberty. Now, when it comes to anything regarding autonomic control and dystonia, um, I tell folks, I don't know which way it's going to go. Okay. I, I, I said, I, you know, I've been doing this two decades. Uh, I've given up trying to predict what's going to happen with puberty because I've seen a bunch of patients that puberty really agreed with them and really improved their overall quality of life and symptoms and some that made a whole lot worse. Right. And part of that is that Puberty in terms of the time of age where it happens 
is connected to some of the most robust brain development we have in develop in in our entire lives, right? So when you get into the te the tween and teen years, your prefrontal cortex really turns on and wakes up for the first time ever in your life. And that area of brain is what makes us able to do all the things we do as adults. Um, so it really much is our internal filter, right? The reason little kids say and do whatever comes to their mind is their filter isn't on yet, okay? This is the filter. It's the prefrontal cortex. I shouldn't say this. This is going to turn out badly. I shouldn't jump off of this. All of that stuff. Right, so when you improve brain function by going and having that brain maturation, a lot of times when we see improvement, it's really not the puberty, it's really the brain maturity that's really driving the improvement, okay? What I do with all of my patients as we start to get closer to puberty is instead of every six months, I see them every three to four months um, because I know it's gonna go one of two directions. And I have to shorten how much, how sort of how frequently I see them, or else I'm going to miss changes that are going to affect them. Thank you. Uh, more questions online. You may have answered this one already, but with a, a child with epilepsy, would getting tested for neurotransmitters gain additional information for treatment? So the, the relationship between neurotransmitters and epilepsy, uh, there aren't many neurotransmitter disorders that, um, that cause epilepsy. Um, so whenever I see a child who has epilepsy, what makes me think of needing neurotransmitter levels is either A, um, they've run the gamut of medications and treatments and have had no improvement, or B, in addition to their epilepsy, they're getting sent by one of my epilepsy colleagues for all the stuff we talked about. Mm -hmm. um, those are the only two times that, if the, it, that in epilepsy, I would think about doing that testing. Yeah. Uh, we have about eight minutes left. Uh, any more questions from the live audience? Um, got many more here. So. Um, for uh, online is a question on ocular gylic crisis. Are there available meds to help? Are these okay to combine with clonidine? Okay, so for ocular gyric crisis, um, one of the biggest things with, with ocular gyric crisis is, is, the, is your child, is your family member taking a medication that could cause ocular gyric crisis, okay? So as I mentioned earlier during the main talk, um, dopamine is the neurotransmitter about what you think for ocular gyric crisis. Part of the other reason that I avoid using medications that block dopamine activity is that the, one of the main risks you have in using those medications is causing ocular gyric crisis, okay? So anytime a child that I see coming to me with ocular gyric crisis, it's, I go through their medication list, and if there's anything on their list that blocks dopamine, that medication needs to be eliminated. Um, otherwise, you end up treating a medication side effect with another medication, and that's just bad medicine. Thank you. Okay, another question online. In your presentation, you spoke about seizures that cause extreme laughing. This piqued my interest. My two-year-old has daily episodes, sometimes multiple times a day, where body stiffens, arms stiffen, fist clutch, a leg stiffen, feet, toes pointed. She just begins to laugh like crazy. Her longest episode was about 30 seconds. After the laughing passed, she looked confused and concerned, like she didn't know what was going on. We didn't know what to think of it. Get it on video and take it to your neurologist as soon as possible. That is something that a, any neurologist is going to look at that and be able to say, yes, I'm concerned. No, I'm not. Um, yep. That, you know, when I started, people used to have to bring in their, their camcorders, right? Their VHS tapes um, or, or their mini recorders. Um, so we literally had to like, schedule time to come in and have them bring me their videos. Um, 
the 20 years later, our, our electronic medical record, patients can send me a message in the portal and attach their video um, from anywhere. Um, so it's, it's made diagnosing those kind of things uh, so much easier. Um, but that needs to be shared with your neurologist as soon as possible. Great, thank you. Um, how would you treat having too much nephrinephrine if melatonin is not working for your child to sleep through the night? Ah, so melatonin doesn't work on norepinephrine. So melatonin works on the serotonin system. So the way you decrease norepinephrine is my, my good old go-to clonidine, right? Because that's what decreases norepinephrine release. So it's a very common thing for, for folks that don't take care of night awakening to as, as physicians just like well let's give them melatonin give them melatonin give them melatonin because they don't know the norepinephrine piece um so okay um next question online uh, my 14 year old son has severe extra movements which look like seizures but aren't we describe um Ganef seem to be uh, oh, guanfacine. Guanfacine seemed to lessen these episodes, but now seem to have gained, have more again. Is this not a good medication for this movement disorder? Uh, so, uh, is it spelled G U A N? G U A N, yes. F A C I N E? F I, well, that's how they spelled it, but yeah. yes. <laughs> okay, so guanfacine <laughs> is in the same chemical class as clonidine, um, it, is, it works the same mechanism of action. Um, it's a little less potent um, because it only acts on one type of alpha-2 receptors. Um, so oftentimes, and I think you said 14, um, that's one of those situations where if it had been working well and it's not, especially in a 14-year-old, my first question to patients and families with that history is, how much has he grown since I saw him last and what does he weigh now compared to what he weighed when I saw him last? we probably just need a dose increase. Um, but yeah, same, same chemistry um, and same level of safety as clonidine, mm -hmm. just less sedating. Um, clonidine can be more sedating than guanfacine because it's less selective. Great, thank you. One more question online. Um, is it possible for someone with dystonia to also have epilepsy? Oh, yes, 100%. Um, so there, I co-manage, um, I can't even tell you how many patients. Uh, so we have six or seven epilepsy physicians at my institution, uh, two movement disorder doctors. Um, and I can't even tell you how many patients my epilepsy partners send to see me to manage their dystonia. Um, yeah, the two are not mutually exclusive. And some of the genes that cause Epilepsy also caused dystonia and vice versa. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience? We've got two minutes. This is your time. Go ahead. Sorry, I just extending what you yeah. said. How would you be able to differentiate between dystonia and epilepsy? Without an EEG. Without an EEG, yes. Without an EEG, so without an EEG, it's... Um, so what does dystonia look like, right? So the big thing with most patients with dystonia, okay, is the things you, you see um, with dystonia, you will see instead of sort of tonic posturing, right? You'll see twisting, turning, right? So what happens neurologically in dystonia is the muscles that both flex a joint and extend a joint contract at the same time and results in unusual posturing, okay? In epilepsy, seizures, you get these bursts of abnormal activity and you often have both a tonic phase and a clonic phase of movement, but not twisting type movements, okay? So from a pure motor phenomenology standpoint, that's one of the big clues. The other big clue is what do the pupils do, okay? So most patients who are having seizures, pupils get big, 
okay? Most people who are having dystonia episodes, they don't have a whole lot of pupillary change, okay? Um, the second thing is, are they, are they at their baseline level of alertness while they're having the abnormal posturing or are they clearly altered, okay? So, you know, one of the key things that this question comes up all the time is, you know, how do you know without an EEG by you're watching somebody, right? So a lot of folks are like, well, if, you know, wave your hand in front of their face and do they respond? Well, if you're really dystonic, you may not respond. Um, the best way, old school, right? No tests, old school. Um, get up close to them, right? And <sighs> blow air in their face, okay? Somebody who's having an epileptic seizure whose sensorium is altered, they're not gonna respond, right? Somebody who's having dystonia and is awake, but a whole lot of pain, they're gonna blink, they're gonna pull back, they're gonna have facial expression that like, oh yeah, you are in there, you're just stuck right now. Um, simple neurology. Don't spray water in their face, okay? They're not cats, they're people, uh, okay? Uh, you hear some people tell, well, just spray water. No, that's what you do for your cat to stop them scratching. <laughs> you look like you have another question. No? Okay, good. Um, well, thank you so much. This has been so incredibly helpful and full of information. And uh, please help me and thank you. Thank you.